Father, we come before you in the name of the Lord Jesus. And again tonight, we ask you, Lord, draw us by the very kiss of your word. O oh, uncreated God, the man Christ Jesus, we ask you to draw our weak hearts into that bonfire of eternal love. Lord, we ask that the seal of love would enable our hearts not to be drowned or to be quenched by the waters of opposition. God, we long for a heart that's alive, that's not drowned or quenched, as chapter 8, verse 7 says. That love would not be drowned or quenched in the heart of Your people. Lord, come and unlock the heart of Your people even tonight. In the name of Jesus, we thank You. Amen. Session 3 introducing the divine kiss the sevenfold bridal paradigm overview what do i mean by bridal paradigm i'm talking about the point of view or the lens through which you are interpreting the kingdom of god every one of us have a paradigm of life we don't have to use the word paradigm but it's the perspective, the bias that we have when we view all of life. A lot of people in the kingdom of God have a paradigm of the kingdom where there's no supernatural power in it. And so when they open the Word of God, they don't see the gifts of the Spirit in a way that's relevant for their everyday life, but rather they see the gifts of the Spirit mostly as a history lesson for the past. And then when they get touched by the Holy Spirit in a certain way, their paradigm changes. And when they open the Bible, they see the gifts of the Spirit everywhere. They see the power of God. They go, what was I thinking? That's because they had a paradigm shift. They put on a new set of glasses. They had a new lens. And with that new lens, they have a new bias. And they, and they see these newly discovered truths everywhere in the Word of God. And my prayer is that the Lord would cause you to have a bridal paradigm of the kingdom of God that you would see the beauty of the bridegroom, the beauty of the bride, and the holy romance of the gospel everywhere that you look in the Word of God. And once the Lord touches your heart in a certain way, it's a progressive touching, of course, you begin to see the beauty of Jesus in a way that you never thought of. You see the familiar stories in the gospel and His splendor and His hidden beauty freshly unveiled to you begins to woo you in love in a new way because you have a, a paradigm of the beauty of the King. When you begin to just a little bit discover the hidden beauty of your own personhood in the gospel, you begin to discover it everywhere. When you begin to be touched a little bit by the divine romance, you begin to discover it everywhere in the gospel. I call it a bridal paradigm. It's a bias through which we look at the Word of God and discover fresh truths that have always been there, but they have been unknown to us and unfamiliar with our experience. I'm going to talk about a sevenfold bridal paradigm and relate it to the imagery of the divine kiss. This passage, it's actually the passage we're dealing with is chapter 1, verse 2. It's one line, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. This passage describes, or it hints at, is, is better to say, the sevenfold divine kiss and how it relates to the bridal paradigm of the kingdom of God. This bridal, par this bridal paradigm is fundamental to the theme of the bride's life in the Song of Solomon, as well as the theme of everyone that sincerely seeks the Lord. Skip a few sentences, though the, go the goal of this session is to provide some tracks of understanding to run on. And once these principles are established, once you, even with greater clarity, see this bridegroom paradigm, then you're going to, we're going to be able to move more quickly through the song. But I want to lay again foundational themes that you're going to run into everywhere. But I'm, my prayer is that God would awaken your heart, some of you for the first time, and others of you to strengthen that which has already been awakened, so that you begin to see new things in this old song. The next paragraph, the most dominant theme in the song is the affection of God. Specifically in context to the beauty of the bridegroom and the bride in the holy romance. Once again you see the beauty of the bridegroom and the bride 
in context of the Holy Romance, you see it everywhere, and you see it throughout the whole Word of God. Once you see it in, in a significant, I mean, even in a beginning, yet significant way, then you find it everywhere that you look. That's what I have found in my experience. A diligent study along these lines is so important to our own emotional health. We'll be transformed when we understand the way God thinks and the way God feels, especially about us and our weakness. We will be significantly transformed emotionally when we touch a little bit of how God thinks and feels about us and our weakness. It will cause us to run to Him instead of run from Him. It will cause us to open our spirit in a deep way to Him and instead of close our spirit, to guard our spirit, which is the posture of the condemned heart. The believers that live in a condemned heart, though they seek the Lord, they seek the Lord, and, but the posture of their heart is that of a closed spirit. Chapter 8, verse 7 calls it love that is not quenched or love that is not drowned by the rivers and the floods. And so many in the body of Christ have a quenched heart. Love has been quenched and love has been drowned. They have a drowned heart or a quenched heart. And this song is to unlock that heart by the, fi by the uh, fire of God. Okay. The cry for the bridal kisses. The whole eight chapter love song unfolds the implications related to this divine kiss. This is the theme of her life. The divine kiss is a metaphor of, inf uh, of intimacy with Jesus. Please don't think of kissing Jesus on the mouth. This is entirely outside the boundaries of God's Word. On occasion, a man will come to me at a conference and will say, I can't picture Je uh, Jesus kissing me on the mouth. And I always say, good, you're not supposed to. It's only a metaphor speaking of the deep things that God gives the human spirit in redemption. I always imagine God putting His hand upon my heart and like His hand has fire in it, just ex uh, it imparts an ex uh, fire into my heart and expands my heart with divine light and fire. That's the, the, um, uh, that's the way that I uh, uh, think of this. When the Lord kisses me, His hand is touching my heart, awakening it. His kiss touches my heart and expands my capacities to receive and to give myself. Okay. The divine kiss. A couple sentences later, it's written in the language of love. Specifically, the language of married love. He's talking about the touch of God upon the human spirit in the language of love. It, specifically, in the language of married love. Why? Because this is a marriage song. Why? We will be married and we will be in love with the bridegroom forever and there's nothing more appropriate than he would woo us through a marriage, uh, a marriage song, a love song of marriage. Because you're really engaged, you're a spouse to the Lord. It's a reality. Some people struggle with the, the romance imagery because they, they don't have a bridal paradigm. They don't understand they really are married already in the espoused form and the consummation of the marriage is in the age to come because they don't have that foundational premise this book trips them a bridegroom king that would speak to his people in a marriage song is the most practical and even predictable thing that, that if you think it through all the way of course he would do that I can't imagine a bridegroom fully in love with his Bride soon to be, his espoused bride in the Jewish tradition, being a gifted songwriter and singer and then having him come up and, and talk to her about agriculture or principles about life. Of course he would woo her with a love song. That's exactly what he's doing. Again, it only makes sense. It's predictable once you have a bridal paradigm of the kingdom of God. The Lord knows that our destiny in eternity is to be the bride of Christ. And that we're the espoused bride even now. How appropriate to write the deepest expressions of his affection through the language of bridal love. The kisses of his mouth. They're distinguished from other kisses in the Bible. There's the kisses of a friend. The kiss on the hand of a friend. There's the kiss on the feet of a servant. There's the kisses of an enemy. But this is uh, specifically the kisses of the mouth. It's speaks of the kiss of divine romance, the kiss of romance, and in this case, 
divide in romance, the kiss of married love. Okay, the kisses of God's word. The kiss of God's mouth. She says, let me know the kisses of his mouth is associated with the words that proceed out of the mouth of God. That's a very important point. In other words, it speaks of the scriptures that tenderize and empower our hearts in the love of God by the Holy Spirit. The kisses of his mouth speak of the release of the word of God because the mouth of God is that which the word of God proceeds from. Jesus said it. He quoted Deuteronomy 8 verse 3. He said, man shall live by that which proceeds from the mouth of God. He speaks of the Word of God. We live, our heart lives by that which comes from the mouth of God. The kisses of God. And when the Word of God, when we receive the Word of God in a bridal paradigm, when we receive the Word of God in a bridal paradigm, then it's the kisses, it's the, it's the Word of God that romances us into the Romance of the gospel that woos us into the romance of the gospel. There's many dimensions of the word of God. There are apostolic strategies. There are governmental principles. There are relationship skills. There are ministry skills. There are, there's all kinds of different categories and uh, uh, different uh, uh, approaches to the word of God. But the Song of Solomon is taking the, bride, the, the bridal paradigm, the approach to the Word that woos the heart into the holy romance, that reveals the beauty of the bridegroom and the bride. It's the kisses of his mouth. Again, if we needed apostolic strategy, God would undoubtedly use a different metaphor of his Word. But when he speaks of the kisses of his mouth, he's talking about the Word of God that awakens and that woos the heart into the bridal paradigm, specifically. And when she says, let me know the kisses of your mouth, she's asking specifically not for more apostolic strategy on how to win her city, though that's very valid. That's for another book. Read the book of Ephesians if you want that, or the book of Acts. First or second Corinthians. Those, uh, those books will carry the the apostolic uh, uh, government of the Word. But this is the kiss of the Word. The song is dedicated to the, that concentrated fo uh, uh, focus of the romance of the gospel. For the last 3,000 years, again, this book, as you know, was written about 1,000 years B.C., so that makes it 3,000 years nearly. The rabbis have referred to this verse, let me know the kisses of his mouth, as the kiss of God's Word, or often, and even more accurately, they would call it the kisses of the Torah. For 3,000 years, the rabbinic tradition has mostly interpreted this is the kiss of the word, the kiss of the Torah. So this is the most common interpretation. I believe it's the right one. But again, I want to make it clear, it's not, it's not the word as it pertains to apostolic strategy. It's not the word as it pertains to growing in ministry skills. It's not the word as it pertains to growing in relationship skills or or understanding the how-tos of life. It's specifically the Word of God that woos us into the divine romance. It's the Word of God that awakens more understanding of the bridal paradigm. That's what she's praying for and asking for in a very specific way. There's more to the Word of God than the bridal paradigm, but through the lens of the bridal paradigm, I believe we best interpret all the other dimensions of the kingdom of God. Without the bridal paradigm, I believe we come up significantly short of God's intention of all the other areas of the Word of God. It's a vastly important subject for this hour. Oh, I long for the day when the apostles and the prophets are rooted and grounded in a bridal paradigm, and then they... They, they, they minister out of that reality instead of devoid of that reality. And when they think of their ministries, they don't think of increasing their sphere of influence. They think of winning people to the romance, to the first commandment for Jesus and getting out of the way, the, the friend of the bridegroom spirit. And I believe that that's going to be a very, very common reality in the body of Christ. We must be very cautious to allow the Scripture to be the glorious boundary lines of our experience of intimacy. I underline the word glorious. Those boundary lines are complete. They don't come up short. They're not 
in any way uh, inadequate. They are complete and glorious, the boundary lines of Scripture. It is significant that we seek the kisses of His Word and not the subjective kisses of our own imagination that are not grounded in Scripture, but rather in soulish and sensual imagination. Sensual is good if it's, if it's walked out under the will of God. Sensual isn't necessarily bad, but my point is, is that I've seen people take this passage in this book and they are reckless and they're, and they're wild and they're not disciplined by the Word of God and they come up with all kinds of strange and wild ideas that they think are glorifying to God. These wild imaginations will hinder us and distract us from genuine holy passion. We don't have to come up with something outside of the Word of God in the sensual, imaginative arena in order to have the highest of the highest. No, the Word of God is our boundaries. I don't want, I don't want any of you distracted from genuine, holy passion with Jesus through an unsanctified imagination. The second thing, besides distracting us from true passion, the second thing that's going to happen is that they're going to cause the Song of Solomon to fall into disrepute in the larger body of Christ. It will cause the message of this book to be held suspect and to be uh, uh, cast away and looked down on because the fruit of it will be wild, sensual people not restrained by the Word of God in their interpretations of this book. And thirdly, I believe if we run wild with this, our hearts become vulnerable to destructive deceptions in arenas that will hurt our life. I've read, again, I have, I told you about 140 commentaries, and I've read quite a few different versions of the Song of Solomon, and I mean, some of it is, is absolute, I mean, the uh, certain elements of the, of the gay community use this book to establish some of their premise points. All kinds of different points of views you can find in this book if we're not disciplined by the Word, and it's the kisses of His Word. It's the kisses of the Word of God is what we're looking at. The kisses of his mouth, and out of his mouth proceeds the word of God. It's important. I know most of you, that seems like, well, of course. But I want to equip you with that caution so when those that maybe you will minister to in the days to come, they begin to get a little wild, you can pull them in a little bit. We are people of the word of God, of the Logos. We don't need anything beyond the word of God to enhance our understanding, right? Right? The boundary lines are sufficient and they're glorious. They're, they don't limit us in any way. Matter of fact, it's the boundaries of the Word of God that free us to enter into the deep things of God. Okay, the divine kiss, cultivating a, a bridal paradigm of the kingdom. The divine kiss, I should say, my interpretation of the divine kiss. This is not... Uh, some, there's nowhere in the, in the Bible where it says there are seven different realities. I have, to me, it's, it, uh, it, it uh, comes together without effort. I, I, I see these seven spiritual principles reflected in the gospel to equip us to experience and understand the bi- bridal paradigm of the kingdom. This bias of the beauty of the bridegroom and the bride that woos us into the romance of the gospel. This paradigm of the kingdom enables the Spirit of God, enables us by the Spirit to experience the romance as Jesus is revealed as the bridegroom king. The seven dimensions of the bridal paradigm, they have many applications. Notice that the kisses of his mouth are plural. There's many different ways in which the Spirit of God uses the Word of God to woo us into different dimensions of the heart of God. Again, always restrained and restricted in a a way that gives us liberty by the Word, but the diversity is present. The kiss of God brings us into the romance, and there's many different dimensions of experience of our heart in this romance, and there's seven of them that that I feel comfortable with, seven of them that that I'm uh, enjoying and operating in. I'm not in any way, I don't want to go beyond my boundary lines and claim a special inspiration on these because I don't believe that I, I have it. These, the Lord allows us to operate within the framework of our own personalities to understand things on occasions. And this is how one day I might say 10 or 12, but these are the seven that I've 
connected with in my own heart. But the reason I say that, I don't want a, a person that's new at this to go out and get in a kind of a, a feisty spirit saying, well, no, there's only seven. No, no, no. That's Mike Bickle's version in 1998. Thank you. Speaks of the seven longings of the heart related to seven designs of the human spirit. I have identified seven cravings in your spirit that reflect that reflect the creative genius in the design of the human spirit. These are, because these seven designs of the human spirit reflect the creative genius of God, you can't repent your way out of these longings. You can only satisfy them in the gospel. And of course, the great tension of life is, we by nature seek to satisfy these seven longings outside of the gospel. And then I believe when we're born again, we attempt to satisfy them partially in the gospel. But in the context of the bridal paradigm, these seven longings, I believe, are most profoundly answered and bring us to the superior pleasures of the gospel that we'll look at in uh, uh, in a week or two. The bridal paradigm is necessary, I believe, to receive the most benefit from this song. I don't have that in the notes. I believe the bridal paradigm is necessary. It's necessary. I'm going to go on the line and say that to receive the most benefit from this song. And I believe to receive the most benefit from the entire Word of God. In terms of our journey to make the first commandment first in our life. As God determines to make the first commandment first before His Son returns, I believe He strategically is is releasing this understanding of a bridal paradigm. And my understanding of it, by the way, is very introductory and very, very beginning of beginning. Now, you may be new at it and say, wow, this sounds deep to me, but I I believe in in 10, 20, 30 years, you'll look back on this class and say, man, he thought he was really in that stuff deep. Well, I'm going to go on record. I know I'm at the beginning of the beginning. But this bridal uh, paradigm is necessary to enable us, to enable us to process the greatest emotional crisis of all of human history that is around the corner. The greatest pastoral crisis the body of Christ has ever confronted, the greatest emotional crisis of all of natural history is around the corner. The eschatological premise. We're going to talk about this unprecedented emotional crisis that's around the corner. The very fact of the final generation as the bridegroom generation. I want to establish that first. I believe that it's a fact that the final generation is in fact a bridegroom generation. We, the, the whole body of Christ will have a bridal paradigm before the Lord returns. It will be widespread. That which is new to all of us now, or most of us, maybe some of you have been in this a lot longer than the rest of us, but it's new to us. I believe it will be widespread. Jesus, I don't have these a couple points on the notes. Jesus is first to introduce the bridal paradigm of the kingdom of God to the corporate church. He's the first one to introduce the bridal paradigm of the kingdom of God to the corporate church. And he introduces it significantly on his last public message before the cross. Matthew 22. His last public sermon. He rebukes the Pharisees in Matthew 23, but that's not a a public sermon. That's a a release of, he's functioning in in the office of judge of Israel. But when he was offering uh, the the, the gospel to the nation, his final one, he said, Matthew 22, verse 2, he said, the kingdom of God is like a great king who is arranging a wedding for his son. And he introduces the bridal paradigm to the corporate church in his very last message before the cross, and that's where it begins right there John the Baptist introduced himself his own ministry through the bridal paradigm he didn't talk about the kingdom through a bridal paradigm but he talked about his own individual life and his own individual ministry through the bridal paradigm but that's significant because John the Baptist was operating under an anointing that properly belongs on the forerunners at the end of the age he was he had a down payment. He was a first fruits of the spirit of Elijah that properly belongs just before the second coming of the Lord. 
He was moving in the spirit of Elijah. That spirit is going to be anointing people across the body of Christ worldwide. But this significant forerunner saw his own life and his ministry through, the bridal, through a bridal paradigm. John 3, 29. And of course, John the Apostle, he, the last four chapters of the Word of God, he reveals the bride like no other does, and he gives the significant hint of the condition of the church in the last days. He says in Revelation twenty two seventeen, he says, and then the spirit and the bride will say, come, and that's when Jesus will come. When the church is operating in a bridal paradigm and says, come, then he will, he will come when the church as a bride says, come. Functioning in a bridal identity, understanding the kingdom of God in a bridal paradigm. When that happens, then Jesus will leave his position at the right hand of God the Father and come back to the earth with all the glory of God the Father. I have written here the final generation. This is the crisis that we're talking about. There's uh, several crises involved. The final generation will have the most emotional brokenness of any time in history. The most emotional brokenness. And I'll just kind of summarize this. I give a, a number of passages and I've come together with seven different categories of the drowned heart. The, G, uh, Jesus would say that that the seal of love, that your heart would not be drowned, the love would not be drowned in your heart, would not be quenched. There's going to be a people without a quenched heart, without a fainting heart of fear. There's going to be more occultic activity. There's going to be sexual perversion at a time so f much more escalating than today. The Lord does not return for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, who knows? The escalation of sexual perversion is just about to explode. It hasn't even started yet, in my opinion. We say, wow, it looks pretty bad. Well, most people begin to get in it and uh, get involved in the perversion and pornography in limited ways, you know, when they're young. Well, this, we're at the generation now. We think what it's going to be like, I mean, at the time now, think what it's going to be like in 10 or 15 years. Ten-year-olds will have such access to so much volumes of perversion at such depth of levels through the Internet that there will be people living 10 and 20 and 30 years in this lifestyle and the perversion with an explosion of the occult with lovelessness, rebellion, lawlessness, fear, hatred, and people fainting for fear in society. All the, I put a number of the verses that Jesus and the apostles described the emotional condition of the last generation. I tell you, it's going to be a crisis. But this bridal paradigm is strategically, I believe, being released to empower us and to touch these seven longings of the human design, to satisfy us like never before with the superior pleasures of the gospel. God wants to satisfy us and fill us where we have an abounding heart in the midst of the most outrageous negative emotional environment the earth has ever known. But there's going to be another great crisis besides the outrageous the emotional environment in a negative way in the midst of the unredeemed. There's going to be the great crisis of history over the offense that's going to happen at the apparent contradiction of the bridegroom king who manifests his temporal judgments. When the beauty of the king, the bridegroom king, the passionate king, begins to kill millions of people across the earth, the apparent contradiction of that will throw the church into a significant crisis, I believe, for a season. Because the body of Christ is not established in a, in a paradigm of God being a bridegroom king filled with beauty and what he does as he begins himself to kill multitudes in his temporal judgments as revealed in the book of Revelation. It's going to, it's going to disturb the church as well as the world. It's going to be a tremendous pastoral crisis and I believe that one of the significant answers is a paradigm, the bridal paradigm of the kingdom of God that establishes us with understanding so that we can make sense of these things and there's no contradiction in them whatsoever. Okay. Seven dimensions. <clears throat> I believe these, again, speak of seven longings of the human spirit. These are cravings and longings that you can't repent of you can repent of seeking to fulfill them in a wrong way but really you're just repenting of sin when you do that you're not repenting of the longings but some people get confused and they actually instead of repenting of seeking to fulfill them in unsanctified ways they actually repent of the longing itself and they can't you can't get free of these these flow out of the genius of god they're a part of your design your 
You're, you're, you're uh, built this way. You're wired this way at the very core of your human spirit. The Lord wants us to repent of seeking to fulfill them in unsanctified ways, and He actually is going to go the other direction and, and deeply satisfy us by fulfilling these to where these superior pleasures of the gospel that flow out of the romance of the gospel will be our experience, and these will make us supernaturally powerful in our hearts before pornography, occult, rage, bitterness, and what appears to others as a contradiction of the bridegroom king who judges the earth. We will see no contradiction in it. We won't find ourselves powerless and hopeless before the before the, the uh, revival of sin that's about to hit the world, the unholy revival that's going to escalate, we will be supernaturally empowered because our hearts will be filled with pleasure in, these, in this bridal paradigm. So I believe it's absolutely significant that we are established in these things and there's no song, there's no part of Scripture like the Song of Solomon, line upon line, bridal paradigm of the kingdom of God. It's absolutely fantastic. You have a, we all have a longing to be fascinated to be fascinated. This is satisfied by the revelation of the beauty of the bridegroom king. We need to marvel and experience wonder and awe in order to emotionally function at our highest level. In order to emotionally function at our highest level, we need to be fascinated. Did you know that? The opposite of being fascinated is bored and passive. And when we're bored, we are vulnerable to Satan in a very, very specific way, in the condition of boredom and passivity, we cannot function at our emotional highest without being fascinated, without being marveled, without having a sense of awe. Secular entertainment targets this human need. Secular entertainment builds upon this passion of the human heart. Secular entertainment exploits this craving of the human spirit and destroys our hearts. I don't, I'm not saying all secular entertainment destroys you. That's not exactly what I'm saying. I'm talking about the, the inundation of our culture with secular entertainment destroys our hearts. I believe it's possible to partake of it with discretion and with uh, 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 restraint according to a proper measure. And I believe you can find edification in a way that's within the bounds of Scripture. But secular entertainment in the life of a believer who's devoid of marvel and fascination of the beauty of the Lord, they are so vulnerable to it, they just overdose on it, and they stuff their self, they dull their heart, and they just they satiate their heart with junk. The Lord wants to fascinate us and to satisfy that longing for fascination. The beauty of Christ Jesus. Second longing, the longing to possess and feel beautiful. Every one of us have a longing to possess beauty and to feel beautiful. Use whatever language that you want. Men don't typically use that language. They say something like be cool or something. But it's all the same thing. Every one of, every human being on the earth has a longing to possess beauty and a longing to want to feel beautiful. There's something in the human spirit that detests being ugly, that the test of being broken down, there's something in it that says no, and we exert energy to fix that which is less than our best. And we, do, we go to great extremes to improve that which God has given us in the arena, arena of beauty in the natural uh, arena. And again, there's, there's godly restraints and boundaries uh, that enable us to participate in the in that quest for even establishing natural beauty. Some uh, groups have gone too far and they disavow every, every uh, relationship to natural beauty. And I, I don't think that's the highest. But the problem is that our culture is obsessed with it. Like the entertainment has, has is, it, we're seeking to satisfy our longing to be fascinated. We have an obsession with natural beauty that is breaking our lives. So many of the sexual disorders and the eating disorders are linked to an obsession with natural beauty beyond the boundaries of God's Word and a, a, a near complete neglect of the spiritual beauty that we possess in time partially and in eternity fully that is really ours. Okay. The longing to be great. The longing to be successful. 
It's satisfied by the revelation of the redeemed as enthroned at the right hand of Jesus. It says, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. This is indescribable. You will live among royalty forever and forever because you are royalty. After some of us get over the shock of this reality and we find out that we are arrayed in the robes and in the lifestyles of the rich and famous in the eternal city, it will, after we get over the shock of it, we'll begin to reinterpret our life on the earth. You married into great wealth. You married into the royal line. You will live a lifestyle of the rich and famous forever and forever and forever and forever and forever. I think you'll make a good rich person. After you get over the shock. In reality, you will be amongst the most wealthy of the eternal city for billions of years. You will be among the elite. You possess unimaginable wealth and honor and power. You do right now. You can't operate all of it right now. We can only operate just a token of it in this age. But for billions and billions and billions of years, you possess unimaginable wealth and honor as part of the royal line. It's absolutely true. The aristocracy of heaven, you're a part of it, of the aristocracy. It's true. I'm not being cute. I'm being real. But we will walk in such humility as aristocrats and wealth and power amongst all the ranks of God's created order in heaven and, and the possibility of His continued created order that goes on in billions of years. Who knows? Those are things we know nothing about. We will be made humble by gratitude. We will be very wealthy aristocrats with royalty, but with such meekness that is so different than the aristocrats of the earth because we are wounded in love by gratitude. We'll see the scar-marked hands, and we will operate in our wealth and in our power in a way so different than anyone else, than, than the common person of the earth who has wealth and royalty. And another thing that will hold that, that will cause us to act so different is just the, the, the very power of lovesickness. That holy preoccupation that subdues pride. A lovesick man and a lovesick woman is so preoccupied that it subdues pride in their life in this age or the age to come. You get a man or a woman absolutely intoxicated with love, they don't even care about showing off at the office. Unless, of course, she's at the office, but that's a different story. I'm telling you that this love sickness, this holy preoccupation will subdue negative things in our lives, and that can operate even now. Okay. We will fully experience nobility and honor. The nobility and honor we long for. We will fully, we, we long for it and we will fully experience it. You can't repent of the desire to be successful and great. You can only repent of seeking to satisfy it in a wrong way. You are great. You married into royalty and wealth. There is no way out of it. You will live in such meekness by a gratitude and love sickness. You will be a very, very different class compared to the aristocrats of the earth, subdued by gratitude and love sickness. The fourth longing, a longing for intimacy without shame. Every one of us longs for intimacy without shame. It's satisfied by the revelation of the tender affections of the heavenly bridegroom. This longing for intimacy, to fully know Him. Oh, we want to know Him. Did you know that God is trusting and desiring to give unique secrets of His transcendent beauty to the redeemed? That I believe even the ranks of the angels stand back and only peer into and wonder at what's going on. There, I believe there's dimensions of knowing the Lord that we will have, that the angels don't even fully understand the full import of the gospel, Ephesians 3.10. They're still looking at the church to sort it out what's happening, and they've been with the Lord for maybe millions of years. Who knows? And they don't know even the full import of the gospel, but we're going to know Him fully one day. And they've been there for ages and still don't understand the full implications of the gospel yet. 
So my point is, I believe there's a boundary line that they won't cross. I believe they'll grow in their understanding. But we are brought into a, a, a position, a, priv- a privileged position of the secrets of God. I didn't say all of them, because I believe God's vast being is beyond even exhausting through the eternal ages. We'll peer into them. But we will be fully known without any shame. We'll have no fear of being left to live the mystery of life alone. We'll have no fear whatsoever of being left to live the mystery of life alone. The Lord Jesus wants us to experience intimacy with us even in our pain. He wants to experience intimacy with us. I don't have this in the notes. In our prosperity. He wants to experience intimacy with us in the passions of our heart. He wants to be intimate with us. So much of our life is unknown by anybody. The Lord says, I will fully know you. It goes unnoticed or it goes misunderstood. The Lord says, I want you to know I'm going to be intimate with you in your pain, your prosperity, and the deepest longings of your heart. I will be intimate with you. I will know. I will recognize. I will acknowledge. And I will see the very glory of your heart. And I will see your struggle in sin. It's it's quite an amazing reality that in in the realm of pain, he sees us. He walks with us and with intimacy in our pain. He's walked with us through so much sin and would-be scandal. He covered us. He protected us. He didn't tell anybody. Then he believed in us. Now, that's intimacy. He's walked through you, through the whole thing, with you, through the whole thing. Now, maybe you've not been aware of it, but there's an intimacy you will be aware of in the age to come. It's amazing. He feels the pain. He protects us. He covers us. He has an intimacy with us in pain in terms of our struggle and our sacrifice. The heroic struggle of the martyrs and all the heroic struggle that every believer goes through to walk in faith and obedience, there's an intimacy in the pain of that that he will enter in, that he already has entered in, but we will understand that we are known one day in fullness. But it doesn't just, it's not just limited to intimacy and pain, there's intimacy and prosperity as well. Your greatness Only he fully understands. Your true nobility, the heights of your true nobility, the fullness of your joys, he will experience with you. So it's not just that he's intimate in pain, he's intimate in in prosperity, but not even just that. He's intimate in the passions of your heart. He knows your longings, he knows your dreams. He knows the cries of your spirit, the longings you have in time and eternity, We will be intimate with Him in a way that the angels are not invited into. It's a very, very dynamic reality. Okay. Longing for the assurance of being enjoyed. By the revelation of the finished work of the cross and God's emotional capacities, His emotional makeup. Every one of us long to be enjoyed. The opposite is the spirit of rejection, of which probably every human being on the earth struggles with in different degrees the spirit of rejection we have a longing for the assurance that we're pursued that we're enjoyed there's nothing that he will deny us if we don't deny him he pursues us he longs for us and he wants us to understand that that he doesn't just save us and give us a passport to heaven he likes talking to us he likes ruling with us He likes us. He enjoys us. It's not just that he wants to marry us. He actually appreciates and enjoys and pursues us as persons before him, as friends. There's a friendship. There's a fatherhood dynamic. There's a bridegroom dynamic. There's a friendship dynamic. It's just the enjoyment that he has. When he forgives us, he enjoys us. It's one of the fundamental doctrines of the Word of God of which Many, many of God's people are not established in that, and again, they run from Him instead of to Him when they struggle with sin. Let's move on. The longing to be wholehearted. The longing to be passionate. Satisfied by the impartation of divine love to our hearts. We long to be empowered to be abandoned. We long to know the joy of lovesickness. We do. We want to live a life where our hearts are touched 
by love in such a deep way that it never ends and it's never defiled and it's never compromised. We want the power to be abandoned. We want to know the joy of lovesickness. We were created that way. To experience love that lasts forever and forever and forever. That we feel every day that our heart goes on in passionate power forever and forever and it never ever ends. We would stay that way forever and it would, we don't ever fear that our hearts would become compromised and defiled and weak and divided again, but zealous, not passive and bored, committed, not compromised, no divided heart. We were simply made in such a way where we have to be wholehearted or we break on the inside. And the ache of disappointment, of, of earthly loves in many arenas, not just the romance area, but the friendship area, the family areas, the ache of earthly loves that, are, that, have, that have wounded us, the Lord wants to use those to lead us to the heavenly romance. He wants to lead us. They are, they are uh, just the very cravings in our hearts and the pains. The Lord wants to use them to woo us into the romance of the gospel, but we have to have a paradigm that says that's what He's about. He wants us to have the power of wholeheartedness, longing to make a deep and lasting impact satisfied by the anointing of service that results in eternal rewards, we want to share things that cause other people to be exhilarated. We want to bring the answer that radically changes the lives of people. We want to discover something that the people we love most, we tell them and they're exhilarated and we're exhilarated in their exhilaration. We're made that way. You can't repent of that. You can only throw yourself into it. And it's called bridal partnership with the Son of God. Working together with Him to awaken other hearts in love is the highest definition of that reality. Okay. The divine kiss. The bride's supreme request. What I have in the notes here, I'll just uh, kind of... uh, summarize it is that when Solomon was first established as king the Lord visited Solomon in a dream most of us know that account of scripture the Lord stood in front of Solomon he said Solomon whatsoever things you ask for you can have the verse in Mark eleven twenty three, where the Lord says whatsoever things you ask for believing you have received them then they will be yours. It's this blank check to operate in any sphere of the will of God that we focus our faith and seek the Lord for. And he tells Solomon, he goes, anything you want, blank check. Solomon asked for the anointing of wisdom. And it's more than that, but that's a summarized version. And the Lord says, that's good, Solomon, because you could have asked for riches, honor, and long life. But you asked for wisdom. He goes, that was good. And it said, and the thing pleased the Lord. And then the Lord told Solomon, he goes, it was a test. I wanted you to use the blank check. I wanted you to use the open door of opportunity to receive wisdom to rule my people. You did good. He says, you could have asked for riches, honor, and long life. It was a test. And uh, what happens is that uh, God gave him that anyway. I believe Solomon is the writer, the author of Song of Solomon, it's just my theory that this is actually in his mind. If she's asking, let him. Let me know the kisses of his mouth. I believe she's speaking to the Father. She's speaking to the one, I have this in the notes, that has authority over the Son. Who has authority over the King to commission him to release his kisses? Only the Father. She's saying, let him. She's asking for the only one that sets his course. And I believe that Solomon is is uh, presenting this in a way that's parallel, that's reminiscent of his own experience with the Lord. And the Lord's asking the body of Christ, Mark eleven twenty three, whatsoever things you ask for believing in the will of God that you'll focus and press into until you have prevailing faith, you can have it. There's many areas of the kingdom of God that are permissible to, to enter into. And if you believe that you've received it because there's a quickening of faith in the relationship with the Lord, He says you can have it, it's yours. And I believe that he's depicting the end time church is saying, I want the kisses of God's mouth. I want the deepest things that God will give the human spirit. I believe that this is what 
I believe this is what uh, uh, the, the bride is asking for. It's interesting that God told, the, told Solomon, he says, I was only testing you. You could have asked for riches, honor, and long life. And you know what? A lot of, uh, not a lot, but a certain number of the body of Christ used the open door of opportunity before the Lord and the grace of God to ask primarily for riches, honor, and long life. That's specifically what they ask for when the door of opportunity, when they draw near to the Lord. And there's nothing wrong with that. It needs to be secondary, not primary. But God's raising up a people that long for the kisses of God's mouth as the primary supreme request is the, as they experience those times of drawing near to the Lord and the grace of God. We want the deepest things that God will give the human spirit. I talk about the the, nece- the difference between godly intentions, godly intentions, and spiritual attainment of maturity. And my point in here, and, and, and I, I wrote it out quite a bit so that I, I wouldn't have to cover it. The point of it is this. Is that when she asks for the kisses of his mouth, that's the intention of her heart. She's not... It's not something she's attained to yet. It's something she's setting her heart on. And the Lord calls us to set our heart on godly attentions. But what people do, they, they, they take their focus off of that and they measure their spiritual attainment. There are, so many people are distracted by measuring how far they've attained when the Lord says focus on the beauty of Jesus and the, the, the establishing of godly intentions in your heart. The establishing of godly intentions. As I mentioned last week, I don't measure my attainment. I don't know if I'm further this year than last year. I don't do that. I I put my focus in two directions. I set my intentions right. I want to know the kisses, the sevenfold kisses. I want to be fascinated. I want to see my own beauty. I want to walk in greatness, God, before you. I want to be a passionate lover. I want the deep things of God. Those are the kisses of his mouth. Those are the sets, the sevenfold kiss. I posture my heart to reach for those things, and I let the Lord measure how far I've gone. And right through the book, the focus is upon her, focusing her attention on setting her heart on things, not determining how much she uh, measures up. You can read that more. It's a very important distinction between intentions and attainments. Many believers are really distracted by trying to figure out where their attainment level is of maturity. I talk about the threefold nature of the, of the cry for his kisses. I believe it's a prophetic cry, and I give a, a, a page on each one of these. This cry for the sevenfold kisses is what God's doing in the earth today. I believe it's the great prophetic cry of the Holy Spirit. I believe it's it's a philosophical cry. This kisses answers why we're on planet earth. It gives us the reason and the meaning of life to enter into this sevenfold kiss. And thirdly, it's a psychological cry. It answers not only why we live, but how we live and how the heart enters into happiness. How does he communicate the kiss to us? I have four ways. Number one, through meditation on the word, primary. That's what we looked at last week, pray, pray reading the word. Okay, it's communicated through others, through others. And we talk about that. See, it's communicated directly through the Holy Spirit in prophetic ex- encounters and experiences. And fourth, the kiss of God can even come, can touch your heart, even through an act of kindness to another person. And I give some, some, uh, uh, a little bit on that. And again, I want to give you more than we could cover tonight because I wanted you to have some, something to go home and read on and to develop more of your understanding on these things. Amen and amen. Let's stand. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.